I2 Ivasa takes on Marcin Tibor this weekend at UFC Vegas 88, and in this video, I'm going to be giving my picks for each and every fight with my exact predictions, how I think the fight is going to play out. Without further ado, let's get into the video. First fight we're going to be looking at on the card is Charalampos Gregorio taking on Chad and Helliger. As you can see, my pick is Charalampos by round 2 KO. Let me explain why. So, Chara has a tendency to block too high when someone is kicking his head, but he does have excellent takedown defense and sometimes uses the takedown defense to go into mount. He's very good at reversing positions. He's not a big submission threat on the ground. Rather, he likes to ground and pound and try to find a finish when he is on the ground. And I think Chara has a savage uppercut and he likes to counter with hook cross combination. So really, he's going out there. He's throwing fire. Now, Chad and Helliger, he started his career 2-7, and 2-5. He's now 12 and 7. So this guy has made quite the career resurgence and he has fought, you know, pretty good guys on the regional scene. He even won belts on the regional scene and defended his belts. Um, in more recent fights, he's looked eh. So he was almost knocked out multiple times by Healy Alatang, even though it went to the scorecards. Alatang won by decision there. The thing, it's like it's very hard to predict this one because Charlampos is an unproven prospect and Helliger is, in theory, someone that is a veteran of the fight game. I ultimately think Charlampos can counter and Helliger when he comes in. You know, and Helliger has a very karate like style. He likes to just go in, he just goes in and gets the shot. I think Charlampos can come back with a counter hook cross and, you know, knock him out. And if the fight does get to the ground, I think Charlampos can potentially reverse positions and get some ground and pound finish. Tiago Moises taking on Mitch Ramirez. As you can see, my pick is Tiago Moises by round three submission. So actually, Tiago Moises was supposed to be the co-main of this card. I forgot who he was supposed to fight. Maybe it was Joel Alvarez. I think he fought him in the past. Not sure. All I know is Tiago Moises was supposed to be the co-main on this card. His opponent pulled out. His new opponent is Mitch Ramirez on a less than a week's notice. So let's get into the breakdown. Moises has been in the UFC since 2018. He's fought 12 times with the UFC, and he's only 28 years old. That was a shock when I was doing tape on this guy. I was like, oh, he's the gatekeeper of the lightweight division. This guy is not that good. And then I'm like, wait, he's 28 years old. That's actually crazy. I thought he was in the UFC for much longer than he was, but no. He has three KO. Uh, he has three KO wins, Moises. That is, but the thing is, they were all prior to joining the UFC against UFC competition. No KO wins. He has eight submission victories on his record, with three of them coming in the UFC. Now, Tiago is mainly going to look to get this fight to the mat ASAP. That's like his bread and butter. He's not going to risk getting KO'd by a guy coming in on short notice like Mitch Ramirez. You know, we did see Moises struggle on the ground and against the fence against Benoit Saint-Denis but Mitch Ramirez does not have the grappling acumen of Benoit Saint-Denis he might be able to clinch with Moises against the cage maybe secure a round like that <clears throat> don't really see it happening I mean against Pretez we saw Mitch go for a takedowns right you know Mitch was trying to employ some wrestling and he was getting swept by Pretez very easily someone that's really not known for his jiu-jitsu was sweeping Mitch Ramirez once he was on bottom. That's something to keep in mind because Moises is a jiu-jitsu specialist. So, I mean, Tiago is not going to get chinned. He, he doesn't really have any knockout losses. He does have two TKO losses in the UFC, but he has not been slept. And really, Mitch Ramirez can only win this fight if he's like, screw this. I'm going to go out there and stand and bang with this guy. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Tiago Moises can calculatingly win this fight. Get it to the ground, control time, and secure a late round finish by submission. That's my take. Next fight, Corey McKenna taking on Jacqueline Amarim. Now, I have been insanely back and forth about my take on this fight, but ultimately, this is, this is what I see. Jacqueline likes to throw a lot of overhands in order to get her ultimate goal, which is getting the fight to the mat, getting a takedown. The thing is that I've noticed on tape, Amrish is very skittish on the feet. She's very, like, just jumpy. She throws a lot of singular shots. Doesn't really throw combinations unless she's really close in the pocket. Which might be in McKenna's favor here. Because McKenna, that's her only path to victory. Because she has a 10-inch reach disadvantage. She needs the fight to be closer to her. And she also likes the fight to be on the mat. This is a problem. Because... 
Amarim is a sm submission specialist. She loves the fight being on the mat. She loves reversing positions as well. Against Corey McKenna, her only way to win here is to get the fight to the mat. No, she's not going to win by submission, McKenna. McKenna is not really known for that. Rather, she's going to try to pound you out while you're on the ground. Against a girl like Jacqueline Amarim, someone who is insanely good at jiu-jitsu, I don't know if this is going to work. Maybe the 10-inch reach disadvantage will be in McKenna's favor because Amarim might have trouble securing submissions like arm bars and stuff like that because she just has short arms. Not really sure. Another thing I saw about Amarim is that she likes to pull guard later in fights because she wants to avoid striking. And if I'm McKenna, like, just let's keep the fight standing in the later round, you know? Like, McKenna potentially can win this by decision, you know? If she can just stay on top of Amarim for all three rounds and not get submitted, she can win this fight. But ultimately, I'm not sure. Amarim's squeeze on her chokes, not the best squeezes. Against Sam Hughes, she should have beaten Sam Hughes in round one. But she just, she just could not get the rear naked choke to where she wanted it to be. You know, like she, she was squeezing and Hughes wasn't tapping. Against McKenna, McKenna's definitely not getting submitted that way if Amarim's going to have the same type of squeeze. Ultimately, I have officially picked Amarim by decision. I do not have a lot of underdogs picked on this card, so I had to try to find someone. Amarim is my dog. And ultimately, I'm taking decision because I don't know if she'd be able to actually submit McKenna fully. But I think she will have enough control time and land enough shots on the ground where she can take this victory. Next fight we're talking about is Josh Coolibau taking on Danny Silva. And you can see I have Coolibau as the winner by round two submission. Now, let's get into the breakdown. Coolibau has excellent ground defense, but he is prone to being held against the cage, something Danny Silva might be able to take advantage of. Uh, Coolibau does fire a lot of leg kicks, and he has good elbows in the clinch. So if Silva were to try to clinch, maybe he would get caught with some kind of elbow from Coolibau. I haven't really seen a lot of Koulibao knockout power, but let's continue the breakdown. He does have a good one-two, but he does have a tendency to keep his hands low after landing a big combination. Danny Silva, you know, might try to draw out some combination from Koulibao. He knows Koulibao is going to drop his hands after the combo. Silva eats the combo, fires back with his own. I can see that happening. Ultimately, I don't think Koulibao is going to get knocked out in this fight, however. Um, Cooley Bao uses the octagon size well. He likes to maneuver around the cage. If he gets caught with something, he has a tendency to be held against the cage. So I can also see Danny Silva come in with a combination holding Cooley Bao against the cage. Definitely can see something like that. But he also, Cooley Bao hasn't knocked anyone out in the UFC. I also haven't really seen Cooley Bao get rocked in the UFC either. And his one submission victory in the UFC was, you might want to say it's fraudulent, you know? Like, he hit a combo on Melsic Bagdasarian and then tripped him really quickly. And then he just jumped on Melsic's neck. Like, that was pretty, that was a nuts sequence. So that might have been a fluke, honestly, that submission. But we continue. Silva throws bombs on the feet. He has great submission defense. He had a banger on the Contender Series. He is a very low-ranked prospect, but, you know... He was able to secure, uh, what does this say? Silva throws bombs on the feet. Uh, oh, sorry. A very low rank prospect was able to secure Silva's back standing in one of his recent bouts. Yes, Silva got the KO in that. Okay, here we go. Silva got a KO in one of his fights recently, right? In that fight, his opponent w got a standing rear naked choke on him, but was not able to secure the submission. I think Koulibau sees something like that and is like, hmm, I think my main path to victory here is to try to tap this dude out. I don't know if it's to stand and bang with this guy. So ultimately, I give the striking advantage to Silva, but I think he does have a lot of tendencies to give up his back, especially in scramble situations. So I think Koulibau will win by a round two submission. Next fight we're talking about, Jafel Fielho taking on Ode Osborne. And I think everyone in their grandma has Fielho by submission picked. I just happen to have it picked in round three. So let's get into the breakdown. Fielho is a submission specialist. Nine of his 15 pro wins have come that way, with more than half of the submissions being by rear naked choke. He was almost able to submit Muhammad Makayev with that knee bar that we all remember. And any other human in the world would have tapped out to that stuff, but Makayev did not, and Makayev himself was able to get the finish. Uh, Fielho has shown a tendency to throw lazy leg kicks, which his opponents have had success countering with crosses of their own. He was actually dropped in his Dana White Contender Series with this exact thing. 
feel how throws a leg kick, and the guy just comes over the top of the cross. Ode Osborne is a sniper, and I can see him potentially knocking out Fielho if Fielho throws lazy kicks like that. But we continue. Fielho has a vicious left hook. He is not only a grappler, but he is a striker, but he would most likely rather have the fight on the ground. Fielho has power in his hands, let's not forget. Let's go to Ode Osborne. He's super well-rounded, but he has been finished four times in the UFC, two of which were vicious KOs, two of which were vicious submissions. So all of these, all of Ode Osborne's fights are not hitting the scorecards. Fielho does not like hitting the scorecards. There's going to be violence in this fight. I'm thinking Fielho will be able to get the back, something like that. Ode has a very wide stance, so Fielho might not be able to get takedowns as well. And Ode likes to snipe his opponents from range. He has good teep kicks to the body. Like, this is a very good fight. Like, Fielho's only minus 150. At first, I was like, he should be minus 300. Then the more I look into it, the more I'm giving Ode Osborne a pretty solid chance, you know? Like, if Fielho wants to stand and trade with Ode, he can easily get caught with some kind of front kick. But, like... Fielho's striking isn't that much worse than Ode's, although I give Ode the edge there. If Ode could survive Alma Baev, you know, one of the best grapplers in the flyweight division, for at least a round, I think he can survive Fielho for at least a round, and that's why I have round three submission. It can be round two, but ultimately I think it's at least getting to round three, but there's going to be fireworks in this fight. Josie Ann Nunez taking on Chelsea Chandler in the next fight. Now, before I even get into this breakdown, Nunez round three KO. Yes, I that is my pick. That is my pick. Chelsea Chandler, we notoriously know her as the girl that was running away from Norma Dumont in that, whatever. I mean, as soon as she faced any adversity, she literally tried running away. So let's just keep that in mind when we're talking about Chelsea Chandler. Nunez may have the height disadvantage here, but she basically does in all her fights. When you see Nunez go into the octagon, you're like, what? That's a UFC fighter? She, she, but she she's a savage. She is a savage. Her reach is actually only one inch shorter than Chelsea's. So she might be like seven inches shorter than Chelsea, but her reach is only one inch shorter. Nunez's game plan is basically going to swing as many overhand punches as she can before one lands and puts her opponent in a world of hurt. Against a girl like Chelsea Chandler, I can definitely see that happening. I can definitely see Nunez trying to make this a firefight. Chelsea Chandler's like, oh my goodness, I did not expect this. And Chelsea Chandler gets rocked and gets TKO finished. But the, here's the thing. There are two main issues with the game of Josie Nunez. She is okay with waiting for her opponent's strikes. Like, she will, she'll stand there and take a constant barrage of jabs and crosses until she feels she can, like, Tasmanian Devil attack you. Like, she'll just keep eating punches, and then when you stop, that's when she's going to be like this. So, if Chandler can keep up the volume, she might do well in this fight. But, ultimately, Chandler does better as a hammer. She does terrible as a nail. So, I mean, Chandler's tough to scout. Like, her only performance where she looked good in the UFC was against Julia Stoliarenko, who we know now is actually pretty good. And that was at a catch weight of 140 pounds. Chandler KO'd Stoliarenko in the first minute of that fight. But then we saw her fight Norma Dumont. We can't, we can't erase that from our memory, guys. Like, I see Nunez flurrying Chandler and winning by a late round stoppage. But I wouldn't be super surprised if Chandler just snuck out two rounds and won by decision just because she's like clinching and maintaining range. Because Nunez is just so small. But with a woman that small, is it going to be easy to just, just control her against the cage like that? In her previous fight, Nunez had like a 10-foot a disadvantage against Zara Fiam. And she won. Even though she was dealing with adversity, she won. So I'm taking Nunez... But I can see a world where Chandler wins by decision. But I'm, I'm taking Nunez. I'm standing on business. Next fight, Natan Levy taking on Mike Davis. So here we go. Mike Davis has been in the UFC since 2019. But he's only performed in the octagon a grand total of four times since 2019. He did not fight in 2020. He did not fight in 2021. And this most recent fight was October of 2022 where he beat up Vyacheslav Borshev. Mike Davis is simply a strong dude. That has had his way on the ground with nearly every opponent he has faced, other than his debut where he lost to Gilbert Burns, but you can't really fault him for that. He was fighting Gilbert Burns in his debut. I mean, that's pretty rough. So, I mean, he is more than okay with standing and trading, he, and he has brutally knocked out a few, a few of his opponents. His ability to finish submissions might not be all there, but he definitely has gotten super close on a lot of attempts. 
maybe the time off he has been working on his submission finishing abilities so that is something to keep in mind we look at natan levy now he has had three fights in ufc he dropped his debut in a decision against rafa garcia levy has zero ko victories in his nine fight career although he comes from a karate background just something to say big problem for levy if his main method of victory here is to stand and trade with davis because levy's not going to get takedowns on davis you know we have seen davis submitted by gilbert burns but he's just simply stronger than Levy, and I don't see how Levy can get a sub. Levy needs to knock this guy out or win a decision, but how do you win a decision in this fight? Uh, piecing up Mike Davis, maybe Mike Davis's cardio wears as the fight goes on because he just doesn't have a lot of octagon time. Maybe it's like ring rust. That's the only way I see Levy winning this. I mean, Levy can try to clinch against the cage, land takedowns, but like I think Davis is better than Levy in those areas of MMA as well. So it's really hard not to pick Mike Davis. I do think Natan Levy is durable enough to not get finished by Mike Davis, which is why I'm leaning a Mike Davis decision. Moving on up the card to the main card. We have Gerald Mearshar taking on Brian Barberena. And this is just a battle of two UFC veterans. There's no other way to put it. This is not going to be a contender's fight. There's really no stakes here except for a paycheck for both guys. So... We can't really look at this from a narrative perspective. We got to actually break down what these fighters are good at. So GM3 is a submission specialist. 27 of his 35 professional wins have come by submission. On the other hand, Barbarina is a KO specialist. 11 of his 18 wins have come by KO. So of Barbarina's 11 losses, three of them have been by submission. You might be like, oh. That's not a lot of submissions, but then you look a little further with your Finn's magnifying glass and you'll see that th those three submission losses, two of them came in his last three fights. So I don't know if this guy is just gassing out. He just is able to get taken down easily. It could be a combination of the two factors, but ultimately he's getting submitted and he's fighting a submission specialist. Do I have to say more? I feel like I don't, but let's say more. Barbarina can really only win here if he can chin GM3. And GM3 is really only getting chinned by heavy hitters in the division, like Joe Pfeiffer, Hamzat. Other than those two, he's not really getting chinned. You know, he might be getting pieced up on the feet, but he's not getting chinned. But <sighs> GM3 is not a slouch on the feet either. Like, he was able to hold his own against Petrosky, and in the final minutes of the bout, he actually almost pulled off the comeback TKO victory. Thank goodness for Petrovsky that the round ended and he won the fight. But people forget GM3 has hands as well. Ultimately, it's hard not to pick GM3 by sub, which I have picked for round two. Considering Barbarina gets manhandled by most grapplers in the division. Like, even RDA was able to manhandle and grapple Barbarina. And RDA has been in the UFC for a hot minute. And this was in a recent bout. So, I mean, Barbarina KO is live, I, I presume. You know, if he just says, screw this, and just starts firing, GM3's takedowns aren't elite. Most of the time, he's getting submissions, like, by, like, a random happenstance that the fight gets to the ground. But GM3 sub. You can't, you can't not take that. Next fight on the card, Pani Kianza taking on Macy Chiazon. Now, this is a rematch from 2018, a fight where Macy dominated and secured a rear naked choke in round two. At the time, Macy was only 2-0 as a pro, and Panny was 10 and 3. So Panny was already established. Macy was on the come up. Macy got a round two choke. This was six years ago. Let's just keep that in mind. Since then, both fighters have had ups and downs in their careers. Macy actually almost reached the pinnacle of the sport with a title shot, but she lost to Irene Aldana. If she had beaten Aldana in that fight, I could have seen her maybe getting a shot or something. But she lost in round three with an up kick to the liver. She was winning that fight, so let's not forget that. Macy has shown a good get-up game after being taken down. She has good strikes from range. She's very controlling in the clinch. Overall, she's a good female MMA fighter. She is very content with keeping you against the cage and just relentlessly throwing knees in the clinch. And... I don't know if Kianzat is going to fall to those knees. I don't think it's going to be a TKO for Kiazon. But let's talk about Kiazon. So Panny has a similar style to Macy. She likes engaging in the clinch. She has a tendency to give up her back in ground situations. Although she does love throwing up a lot of sub attempts. So if you want to take a flyer on this fight in general to just end by submission, that's probably in the plus four or 500 ranges because the over under two and a half rounds is minus 360. 
So the fight to end inside a distance is like plus 300. If you're just going to go even further and say this fight ends by submission, that might be a good take because Macy submitted her in the past and Kianzat likes to do jujitsu. So, you know, um, ultimately I see this fight being held up against the cage for a lot of it based on how these fighters both fight and based on Kianza lost by submission last time. So she's not going to try to lose by that way again. So I think Chiazon will have enough control time and win by decision here. You know, Panny does try to steal backs from the clinch. That is something to look out for, but she's really only had success against the bottom barrel of the division. Like her last win was against 40 year old Lena Landsberg, who had a 10 and seven record. So Kianzat's not beating any killers. Kiazon actually is and fighting the best of the division. So give me Macy to overpower Panny in the clinch and secure a decision victory. Although ending betting the fight to end by sub is worthy bet. Christian Rodriguez taking on Isaac Dolgarian. This might be the fight of the night, folks. Two hungry prospects matched up against each other. Dolgarian's game plan is simple yet effective. Get the fight to the mat as quickly as possible and land vicious elbows from mount. Now, C-Rod has gone up against grapplers and has shown he can handle them and outmaneuver them, especially in his win against Raul Rosas. C-Rod also has beaten two undefeated fighters in his last two fights. Just something to note. But here's the thing. The main issue with C-Rod is his weight. Almost every one of his bouts, there is some kind of weight miss issue that results in him fighting at catch weight, or he just loses some of his purse, or they just make the fight a whole weight class up. Like this has happened in four of C-Rod's last five fights with some kind of weight issue with C-Rod. Just something to keep in mind. In this fight, C-Rod finally has had enough of weight cutting, he said screw all that, and now he's just gonna fight at a more unnatural weight at 145. Just something to note as well. 145 is Dolgarian's natural weight class. C-Rod should be fighting at bantamweight, but he's fighting up a weight class against someone who's insanely strong, and all we've seen of Dolgarian is just power. So, tough night for C-Rod, I envision. But here's the thing. C-Rod is as well-rounded as it gets. He, but ultimately, he has the most success when he's able to do the controlling. Like, when he's the one being, the, being controlled, not a good night for him. He likes to do the controlling. In his fight against Simon, we saw more of C-Rod striking on this play. And he does utilize a lot of good combos. But I'm not sure if the power is going to translate to a higher weight class. Now, there are a lot of question marks with Dolgarian. He is 6-0 and he has 4 amateur fights. 10 fights total. All 10 fights have ended in the first round. This guy is a savage. It's just C-Rod is a tested UFC guy at this point, And this is... The first person that Dolgarian is going to fight that's going to actually tell us if Dolgarian is good. I think Dolgarian is good. I'm taking him by decision. It might be a hot take, but I don't know if he's going to be able to finish C-Rod. We're going to see how Dolgarian does outside of round one in this fight, I believe. And I think he's just going to be able to control and just hammer away at C-Rod for three rounds and just win a decision. That's my take. Kennedy Nizetchuku taking on Ovin St. Peru, and I'm not going to bore you guys with a long breakdown here. At this point, OSP is just fighting because the UFC is giving him gigantic paychecks to do so. His last three losses have all been by KO, all within the first two rounds, and he most recently got starched by Felipe Linz in round one, who's not really known for insane KO power, but like as soon as Linz landed a shot, OSP was like, okay, yeah, I'm done with this fight. Just knock me out. Here's the thing, though. OSP was able to KO Alonzo Menefield in round two because the way Alonzo Menefield was attacking, he was trying to chase down OSP and got, bam, got caught. Kennedy is minus 600 here, okay? This is not an easy pick. OSP is giving me Donald Cerrone vibes where, like, if you land one strike on him, he's going to crumble. And if Kennedy lands one strike on OSP, I think OSP is going to crumble. No offense to OSP, you're a great guy. I think that's what's going to happen. Is there a world where OSP can chin Nezetruku? I mean, Nezetruku is very similar to Alonzo Menefield in that his striking is not super polished. But both guys pack a huge punch. It's really just, is OSP like just insanely slow forever now? Like he's looked really slow in his last few fights. I don't know if he has that KO ability that we think he has, like that he used to have. And I just, I just can't not pick Kennedy round one KO. If Kennedy just lands a punch on OSP, it's going to be over. Kennedy is chinny. He got knocked out by Dustin Jacoby round one last fight. But 
I don't think OSP ha is, is, is Dustin Jacoby. Moving on to the co-main event, Brian Battle taking on Angelusa. You can see my pick, Brian Battle, round three KO. Uh, and you might be like, oh my God, Finns, you're a genius for that take. You're so smart. Well, it's not really. It's like, here's what's going to happen, okay? Brian Battle, rangy striker. He's shown a lot of power in his recent bouts. He has some finishes now. But we obviously know his one one thing that he just cannot stop is takedowns and he is more than okay with just laying on his back if you take him down he does try to get up but he doesn't have the great he doesn't have great get up defense um he has good submissions on the ground i presume but it's just i think angelusa will be able to get the takedowns he's employing a lot more in his recent bouts and i think he can get the fight to the mat and keep it there so here's the thing brian battle is a sniper if this fight stays in the feet, Battle should be minus 1,000, you know? He has eaten bombs from Treshawn Gore. He's eaten bombs from Fakret Tidinov, and he did not get chinned. He is he has a solid chin. Angelusa packs a heavy punch. He's going to try to outmuscle Brian Battle in this fight. I think Lusa potentially can win the first two rounds. And at that point, I'll be live slamming Brian Battle because Angelusa's gas tank is the one thing that is not his best attribute. Like against Reese McKee, he easily won the first two rounds. Reese McKee almost knocks him out in round three because Angelusa just cannot breathe. He's just dying out there. So I think Brian Battle is no Reese McKee. He's better than Reese McKee. And I think he can find the finish where Reese McKee couldn't. I mean, taking Angelusa by decision, not the worst bet in the world. I don't think Battle's being finished. I'm ultimately leaning for a late round finish for Mr. Battle because of all the reasons stated. It is main event time. It is Tai to Ivasa taking on Marcin Tybora. Let's keep in mind, first thing is Tai to Ivasa's birthday is also Saturday. So if you wanna just blindly slam to Ivasa for that reason, I would not blame you. People who have birthdays on UFC cards usually win. It's just, it's just a known fact. Another thing is Tai to Ivasa is on a three fight losing streak. Earlier in his career, he also had a three-fight losing streak, and then he won the next five fights by KO in the early rounds. Just something to note. So if we're going to go based off history, Tuivasa will KO Taibora in round one. Because when he, you know, the losing streak stuff, his birthday, you know, everything is in Tuivasa's favor. Here's the thing. Tuivasa recently had like a major knee surgery. He might be cooked. We don't know. There's a lot of question marks with Tuivasa regarding his knees, his legs. Against a guy like Tybora, that's tough because Tybora's main path to victory here is going to try to be to clinch and grapple Tuivasa. I don't think he'll be able to knock out Tuivasa. No way does he have the same power as Sergei Pavlovich. No way does he have the same power as Cyril Gan. Tybora needs to clinch and keep this fight as close to himself as possible in order to secure a victory. Tybora at plus 1100 to win by decision. Solid bet. Can he tap out to Ivasa? Potentially. I don't see it happening. I think Tuivasa is going to go out there, swing and bang with Tybora, and just knock him out in round one. Now, you might think I'm a fish because, oh, you're only saying that because Tybora got knocked out in round one in his last fight against Tom Aspinall. Tai Tuivasa is not Tom Aspinall. But here's the thing. Tybora has little to no knockout power, and he has only cleanly KO'd one fighter in the UFC. And that was by head kick. That was 2016. That was against a 19-9 Victor Pesta. That is Tybora's only clean knockout in the UFC. He has been around for quite a while. This fight is going to be stand and bang. And if it's not, Tybora wins. But it has to be stand and bang. That's just how Tuivasa rolls. Like, Tuivasa is very similar to Augusto Sakai. And guess what? Sakai knocked out Tybora in round one. I'm taking Ty round one KO. I'm taking it. Put all the piles on the line. We're taking Ty. And that wraps up another episode of Finn's Chats. Make sure you like, subscribe, comment. Let me know in the comments who you got this weekend at UFC Vegas 88. And without further ado, make sure you have a great rest of your day. I can't see shit, you savage.